Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about divine causality, a few ways of looking at divine causality and how it interacts with our own creaturely causality, and then linking that to a somewhat unrelated subject, uh, or at least seemingly unrelated, to storytelling, how we tell stories, and how we can help to differentiate uh, good storytelling methods from bad storytelling methods, and how that might relate to how we think of causality, uh, whether our own uh, within this world, or uh, the causality of God or the creator. So uh, over the course of this, we're going to have, uh, this video will be roughly in two major sections. First, I want to look at the different models of divine causality. I especially want to look at three of the most common of these views, uh, and three those three which will relate to different storytelling methods that are uh, of varying, uh, varying uh, writing quality. And then the second half of the video will be the explicit comparison. I'll be comparing each of these views to a method of storytelling, and also trying to draw some conclusions about how some bad views of uh, divine causality can match onto some bad ways of writing stories. Now, um, this is actually a very common thing that I tend to do on this channel. I'm, I'm using something that I know quite a bit about, which is divine causality and uh, causality in general, metaphysics, broadly speaking. And I'm relating that to something I know significantly less about, that is storytelling. I'm no storyteller. I'm not a very good one. I never have been. Uh, I, I can do an adequate job when I'm running a game of Dungeons and Dragons, but if I need to start writing a story all on my own, I'm far from competent. That said, I'm very interested in the subject. And so, like I think we all probably should do, we can take the areas that we do know something about and apply that knowledge to something we might know less about so that we can try and figure things out using the knowledge that we do have. So with that, um, I will have uh, markers down below, uh, timestamps. If you are only really interested in the philosophical part, then you're going to be looking at the first half. If you're only really interested in the narrative story part, then you're going to want to look at the second half. That said, without some of the terminology we're going to go over in the first half, you might be a little bit lost as to what I'm talking about. So, uh, so you do that with caution. So. The three models of divine causality that I want to look at are open theism, occasionalism, and primary and secondary causality. All three of these have been common among theistic philosophers through the ages. Uh, open theism, the first, is probably the most common, at least in the uh, in the sort of Anglosphere, and uh, and in general, I would say in the um, sort of uh, Christian or post-Christian West today. Uh, today. Uh, occasionalism, though, has had uh, has had a lot of historical adherence. And, but it is probably less common today, uh, as well as uh, primary and secondary causality, uh, which is a model that was most prominent in the scholastic period of the medieval Christian West. Now, first, open theism. Uh, this is, as I said, probably the most common, uh, the most common view of how uh, God's providence interacts with our own, uh, our own creaturely causality. And interacts is, I think, the most prominent and most important term here. This is the idea that God interacts with other agents, humans, angels, even uh, even you know brute creatures and such, um, as one agent to another. This is the most important aspect. Uh, on this view, God's knowledge of the future is open. The future is indeterminate. This is a very presentist view. If you're not familiar with these terms, uh, I've also done a video on uh, the philosophy of time, uh, and that was also tying in a um, bit of pop culture storytelling. Um, uh, the, the series Loki. Um, if you want to know more about uh, philosophy of time, that's something to look at. But open theism has this idea that the future is indeterminate. It is not determined by antecedent causes. So in other words, the, the future is open to change. I, uh, what I do can truly affect change tomorrow, and if I act differently today, tomorrow will be different. Uh, the same applies to God. God can choose and ordain that the future shall be in a certain way, and God does that. It actualizes a particular future by actualizing things in the constantly evolving present. And so, God's knowledge of the future is determined only by his will, he, by what he chooses to do interacting with the particulars in the world. Why I emphasize the interaction, the interactivity between God and creatures on this model is because they are on a kind of causal par. They are the same sorts of causes. For example, if I were to choose to drink coffee, okay, God, if God has ordained, uh, for example, that I am to be tired later in the day, 
right? Rather than uh, rather than receiving the normal normal energy I would from uh, from my cup of coffee, then what God would need to do to ensure that is to uh, to somehow negate the effects of me drinking coffee, whether that is uh, prematurely cool it so I'm less likely to drink it, I might dump it out or something, um, or perhaps um, God might present before me the idea of having uh, having some kind of a food that'll cancel out the effect. I don't know, turkey? That's probably not true, but let's suppose turkey ties you up. Maybe God would give me the idea of having a copious amount of turkey between now and this afternoon, making me tired. But the important aspect to note here is that if God wants to have a certain thing occur, God interacts with the causality of creatures. Me in this case. I act in a certain way. God acts in a certain way in response to how I act. Now, of course, even on this model, on any theistic model at all, God is infinitely more powerful than any other particular creature. Sorry, any particular creature. Uh, the reason I say any will become apparent as we get to the, uh, the next two options. Um, and that is because a primary criticism of open theism is that it significantly uh, diminishes God's sovereignty, God's power, and God's aseity. Uh, now, sovereignty, simple, God is not, uh, is not uh, subject to any other power or authority above himself. Power, God is capable of doing anything. Those two are relatively clear. And open theism, we can see issues with this, that God's power is, and sovereignty are limited by particular circumstances. God cannot, in the present, alter the past, for example. God cannot directly alter the future except by causes now which will lead to effects, just like we can't. Now, aseity is another more, somewhat more complicated term, less commonly used today, um, but it's a classical description of God, such that God is separate from the world and unaffected by it. This is uh, also referred to as God's impassibility. Uh, God is, uh, to use another, uh, another, maybe less precise, but commonly used term, uh, is uh, impassable, uh, or even we might say dispassionate. God cannot be affected. Right? Change cannot be affected in God by anything that occurs, and that includes my actions, which on open theism would uh, would lead to God causing certain things in response. And because it would lead to God doing certain things in response, what that means is that I am in some least minor sense affecting change in God. I am a reason that God has for acting in a certain way. Now this is uh, this is for open theism. Uh, there's a there's a um, strength to this point is that it makes God more interactive with the world and more approachable, more uh, more imminent. Uh, but that's at the expense of God's transcendence of the world. And so this is one of the primary critiques of open theism. Now, on the far opposite end, we have occasionalism. Uh, occasionalism is what we might think of as a highly deterministic uh, philosophy, but deterministic in a very particular sort. Uh, it is not a uh, is not a series of causal determinism such that uh, that the world is set up like a series of dominoes, one which uh, that cascade, one tipping over the other, to uh, that once the dominoes are set, the end result is determined from the outset. That would be something more like deism, uh, where God sets things up in a certain way and so that a certain outcome will result. Uh, deism, or um, there's another uh, idea of Molinism, which is somewhat similar to this. Other issues that uh, that I'm not going to take the time to go into in this video because I don't think they relate too well to storytelling. To get a little bit ahead of ourselves, occasionalism, though, uh, is the sort of is is a sort of divine determinism. It is that every event, action, and creature, and object, and everything else in creation is entirely and only the effect of God's immediate causality. This is uh, this seems relatively uncontroversial, at least on the surface. That God, being the creator of everything, is responsible for everything directly. However, it is important to note that occasionalism, most importantly, denies creaturely causality, or at least denies the genuine causal power of creaturely causality. That the the causal sequences that we that we uh, we initiate, that we carry out, are not caused by us. They are caused by God on the occasion of something in the world happening. So to go back to the coffee example, I have a cup of coffee. There's coffee in here. The coffee, we would ordinarily say, on a sort of physicalist model at least, has, or maybe an Aristotelian model, has certain properties to it and has certain causal powers. It's capable of hydrating me. 
to a certain extent. It's also capable of dehydrating me, depending on the amounts I drink. But it's capable also of caffeinating, of, of giving me energy. It's capable of warming, because it's hot coffee. It's capable of it's capable of putting out a fire. If I if there were a fire over here, I could dump out my cup of coffee and then put it out, right? It's capable of all sorts of things. However, on the occasionalist view, the coffee itself is not capable of anything. It has no causal powers of its own. All this does is provide God with an occasion to enact certain effects, to cause certain things. So me drinking coffee. That is not me causing coffee to go into my mouth and be consumed. Rather, that is uh, my particular desire, for example, provides an occasion for God to cause the coffee to be consumed. Or God to cause this to move here by, by way of my hand. We might also say that the coffee itself is capable of caffeinating, capable of giving me energy. However, on the occasionalist view, that is not the case. Rather, the, the chemical makeup of the coffee is what provides God with an occasion of giving me energy, biological energy, etc. And then that energy itself is not causal. It doesn't have its own causal power. It, doesn't, it isn't capable of achieving anything, but rather that is an occasion for God to implement certain, certain effects, uh, to cause certain things, me being more alert and awake, for example. So on this model, God is the only one doing any of the causing at all in the world. We don't have genuine causal powers on our own. It is only God interacting directly. Now, this can seem overly deterministic. This can seem like an almost a sort of uh, divine puppet show. Um, and that is one of, the, one, of the, one of the chief criticisms of occasionalism. But it also, it's worth noting... It also, um, so in that sense, it is a uh, sort of, um, sort of inversion of the uh, of the of the, the other view that we've looked at, open theism. However, there's another critique of uh, of occasionalism, which we're going to be looking at again more so in the second half when we're looking at storytelling, and that is that on an occasionalist model, because things in the world, creatures, do not have their own causal powers, therefore they do not have their own causal regularities. They do not have their own laws or principles of action, reaction, motion, change, etc. And what this means is that the, the, the laws, say for example the laws of physics or the laws of chemistry that we observe, are not themselves laws about the things that they are describing. They are instead regularities, the ordinary way, in other words, that God acts within the world. We say that coffee has the power to... Uh, to, to give us energy, or we say that caffeine has certain chemical properties. Only on this model, on occasionalism, we only say that because that is how God ordinarily acts when caffeinated substances are introduced to human bodies. It is not that this has certain effects, this has certain attributes and natures, anything like that. Rather, it is that this is usually the occasion on which God acts a certain way. What that means is that, and this is both a, this is a sort of double-edged sword, because it opens things up for, uh, opens things up, but it also closes things down, that on occasionalism, miracles, the miraculous, things which are out of the ordinary, directly caused by God, are perfectly possible, and realistically should be downright common. Because if the only reason that things behave in an ordinary, regular sort of way, and according to, uh, to laws or to rules or to regularities, is that God chooses to continuously act that way under most circumstances, there's nothing at all preventing God from choosing to act a different way under different circumstances, or even under the same circumstances. God could miraculously cause my coffee to put me to sleep. And that would be just as, uh, that would be no more miraculous than God causing the coffee to keep me awake. They would be the same sort of thing. Because the coffee itself has no causal power. It's just God in both circumstances. God causing me to be awake versus God causing me to be asleep. The coffee is just an occasion for that to occur. So this makes miracles uh, far more coherent and far more easy to explain. However, at the same time, it makes uh, causal sequences and, uh, and the natural sciences, for that matter, far more difficult to explain. It, it, it leads to logical irregularities. 
uh, in what we would come to expect about the world. Now, finally, uh, the view I endorse, which is primary and secondary causality. Uh, this is this was the most common view uh, in the scholastic period in uh, in sort of medieval Western Christendom. Uh, it came to to its highest prominence, I think, in Thomas Aquinas. Uh, but there were were other philosophers going far before. Uh, going there are some shades of it even as far back as Augustine, at least. Uh, and then this was continued, and uh, the tradition was continued. And there are people, even there are uh, philosophers even today who defend this theory quite strongly. Myself among them. And this is a sort of uh, what we might think is think of as a synthesis between the two, if we were willing to overlook history, um, because this is also um, arguably, at least, the oldest of the three views that we've looked at. What this asserts, what this view asserts, is that there is uh, a causal sequence in the world that things cause other things, very much like an open theism, that the coffee having caffeine in it causes me to be more awake and alert. That is a genuine causal effect. That is what is occurring. Right? Taking that sip of coffee is causing certain things to happen within my body. I have caused the cup to raise to my mouth and to drink it. Right? And these causal sequences are genuine. These are, these are efficacious. These do lead one thing to another. And so there is a sort of logical consistency within them. However, in addition to this, there is another, what we might call another layer of causality. There's also causality that God imparts directly to the world, something more like we see in occasionalism. We see, uh, we would see on this, on this model as well, that not only do I drink coffee uh, because I will it, but also because God wills it. It is in fact part of God's providence and it is part of God's creation. Now this, like occasionalism, requires God to be transcendent, very transcendent, rather than, rather than imminent, uh, like it would be in, in open theism. Uh, for God's causality to be non-competitive with my own causality, then God cannot be another agent acting within the world like, uh, like people interacting with each other. This is one of the chief criticisms of, of uh, primary and secondary causality, or the, the Thomistic structure, broadly speaking, uh, and it's primarily criticized by uh, by people who hold to something closer to open theism. Uh, they'll criticize this for being for for separating God too much from the world, for making God unapproachable. Whereas in Scripture, right, we find God to be uh, to be very personal, uh, very uh, very interactive with uh, with uh, the saints and the prophets. And so this is one of the primary criticisms of of primary and secondary causality. Um, however. I think that this is uh, this is a, um, a perfectly reasonable exchange to make for a kind of consistency, uh, consistency of the theory, because this is able to account for both absolute divine sovereignty. God is immediately and completely uh, causally responsible for not only every uh, every thing, every creature, but also every event, every action, uh, or everything that occurs. But so are we. I've gone into this as well in more detail on uh, on some of my uh, uh, my lectures on Anselm's three philosophical dialogues. I'll link those below as well. I highly recommend uh, that series, um, the, a, a long series of classroom lectures on uh, on one of the best, I think, one of the best pieces of prose philosophy ever written by uh, Saint Anselm of Canterbury, um, where he examines th these sorts of issues: causality, uh, how is it that God and and we interact, and also throws the angels in there too for fun uh, and because it works, makes a good thought experiment. But how this winds up working is that we are sufficient causal explanations. Right? My desire for coffee is a sufficient causal, well, my desire for coffee and my capability of reaching over and grabbing it, right, is a sufficient causal explanation for the coffee getting down my throat, right? However, so is God's will that I uh, I drink coffee today. That is also a sufficient causal explanation, but they 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 coincide. Now, if we want to look at the three of these models, if we want to look at them in the context of storytelling. I think that will both help clarify uh, why we have some stories being better and some stories being worse and sort of writing techniques involved. But I think it'll also, I think, uh, hopefully at least, help to clarify what we mean by the three, uh, the three, at least these three theories that we're looking at in terms of divine causality. 
So if we look at uh, the open theist view, uh, the open theist view, as a reminder, is uh, is that uh, we act in certain ways. God interacts with those actions, implements changes to affect His will. This is analogous to a kind of writing uh, which relies on internal causal sequences in the story. You write a narrative. The narrative flows as you want it to flow. Things occur caused by the previous events. So far, so good. A logically, logically internally consistent story. However, if the writer wants some event to occur, the writer will simply allow that event to occur. Independent of the actions and interactions of the characters involved, this is a sort of deus ex machina. This is either um, uh, either uh, an interaction with the characters, sort of from outside, because again, the the author is transcend uh, the author transcends the novel being written in a similar sense to the way God transcends creation. But if we have an interaction between the writer and the characters, then that has to be veiled in some way, or it will be uh, it'll be simply absurd. And so what we wind up having is a kind of JSX machina. Things happen by contrivance to allow the characters to come to a certain conclusion, rather than through their own actions themselves. This is where we find writing flaws, uh, like, uh, like a character finding a crucial plot MacGuffin at just the right moment to advance the story through no prior explanation. The character happens across an object or happens across a plot point or another character that they need to meet at this time um, for no other reason than they need to meet them at this time. He shows up. This is the, uh, the, the writer interacting with the story in a very intimate sort of way, but it is a way that breaks our immersion in the story because it breaks our, the logical sequence of how things go. And it also, it also binds the hands of the writer significantly to the ways that they can interact with the story. Um, rather than guiding the characters towards a certain end through their own character traits and their own interactions and that sort of thing, we find is the, the, the writer inserts things to sort of guide the narrative. It's almost like uh, a good analogy might be if you have, um, um, you have a river flowing and you want it to go a certain way. There are different ways you can do that. You can dig out, you can dig out, uh, uh, irrigation tunnels, say, or not tunnels, um, irrigation canals, that'd be the term. Uh, or you can try and dam parts of the river so it flows in a certain direction. You can place obstructions. This model of storytelling is something more like placing obstructions. You are interacting with the flow of the river rather than guiding it. And so we have what look like artificial changes to the structure of the narrative. And these stand out to the reader. It is very obvious that the writer is inserting his will into the story rather than guiding the story, writing what just writing what occurs. Perhaps more commonly these days, and and far far worse in terms of narrative structure, we have uh, an analogy uh, for occasionalism, which is where events in the story are not seen as events which flow logically from one another, but rather are ordered according purely according to the writer's will. The writer wants a certain end to occur, so rather than considering how might the characters and events and and uh, and locations be arranged such as to produce this end result, rather the characters are set up and act in a certain way such as to bring about that end, but again purely through the writer intervening directly at every step along the process. And this is why we have uh, not just contrivances like on the sort of more open theistic model of the deus ex machina, um, but we have explicit contrivances within the characters themselves, right? where we might find a character who has no reason to act a certain way within the narrative, but they do act a certain way such that the ending will show up in the way that it does. Um, a lot of the a lot of the bad uh, the bad stories that we critique these days, we I just mean viewers, right? We notice bad parts of stories that don't quite make sense. A lot of times it's because of this method of thinking. We think of the narrative as being written by the writer rather than as being a narrative that flows within itself. A way you can look at this is by asking, why did a character perform a certain action? Right. Um, so if we were to ask, for example, 
uh, why did Gandalf choose Bilbo to go on the adventure with the dwarves? Well, we can give two answers to that, at least. Uh, talking about the Hobbit, in case you weren't clear. Um, we can give two answers to this. One, because Gandalf decided to. He chose Bilbo because he knew he knew hobbits. He had known Bilbo before. He knew Bilbo's parents and knew that, that being a took, Bilbo is an adventurous sort and needed to be plucked out of his ordinary and sent on this adventure. Okay. Gandalf has his reasons. But then we can also give a completely separate explanation. That Tolkien needed to write the story because the story's called The Hobbit. And without a hobbit, it wouldn't be the story called The Hobbit. It would be Gandalf and the 13 dwarves. That doesn't seem right. That's not the same story. That's a very different story. And not the one that Tolkien wanted to write. He wanted to write a story about a, about a hobbit. A middle-aged everyman who went on a spectacular adventure with oddball characters. And so, the reason Gandalf chose Bilbo to go on this journey is because Bilbo's the character Tolkien wanted to write about. I mean, that's an interesting explanation, but only from this sort of meta perspective, stepping away from the internal logic of the story and, and looking at it uh, from outside, as it were. And by looking at these two sort of perspectives, we start to see how the third model that we were talking about, primary and secondary causality, can work. We have the primary causality, the primary causal sequence, which is Tolkien wrote it that way, Versus the secondary causal sequence, which is Gandalf made these choices which led to Bilbo going on the adventure. If you take one without the other, then what you, or if you overly, uh, overly conflate the two, say, uh, you wind up with an overly contrived and poorly written story. But rather, if you, if you accept both of them, you say that, yes, Bilbo went on the adventure because Gandalf chose him for these reasons. But also, Bilbo went on the adventure because that's how Tolkien wrote it. Well, and, and now, worth noting, you can also give reasons for why Tolkien wrote it that way. He wanted to tell the story about the, like I said, the middle-aged everyman adventure, the middle-aged everyman who goes on an adventure. So we can give Tolkien's reasons and we can give Gandalf's reasons. Even though Gandalf's reasons are also Tolkien's reasons, in a more primary sense. These two causal sequences, the primary, that being the author, and the secondary, that being the characters and the events in the story, must coincide. Usually when we find a kind of, a kind of dissonance within a story, or a contrivance, or a plot hole, or some kind of failure in the narrative, it is because these two sources of causality are either misaligned or one or the other is missing. Either there is no hand of the author, and things are just happen happening along their way. Uh, there are causal events in the series that the author has no particular direction with. And this is where we find meaningless, like, filler chapters, if you will. Where events in the story just kind of are happening, and we have no idea why. And there doesn't seem to be a particularly good reason. It doesn't seem to be, the, the narrative doesn't seem to be going anywhere. This is because the, the author has no primary causal involvement. The events of the story are simply playing out. By contrast, if we only have the primary causality, if there is no secondary causality within the structure of the narrative, then what we have is a nonsensical, contrived story that is very clearly the hand of the author just moving things along arbitrarily in order to get to a particular prescribed purpose. And I think that looking at these, and now, of course, we can go on to speculate and ask, well, are these bad writers uh, also uh, philosophically inept in, in, addition to, uh, in, in addition to literarily inept? Uh, or do they have bad metaphysical presuppositions or theological presuppositions that lead them to write in this way? Perhaps. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not one to speculate about the motives of writers or even their philosophical underpinnings. Uh, however, these methods of storytelling do provide us with, I think, fantastic analogies to the... the, uh, the ways of explaining divine causality. Because divine causality is a very difficult thing to understand, as we noticed. And especially this interaction between primary and secondary causality, that both of these are fully robust. Uh, to, to carry the analogy back into the, uh, into, the, into the real world, into the world of, of metaphysics and theology, 
primary causality is God's immediate causation of the world, and secondary causality is derivative. It is derived from that, but it is equally real. We, in fact, cause things in the world, and events cause each other. That's a very difficult concept to wrap our heads around. But if we look at storytelling, and if we look especially at the best storytelling, where these coincide properly, we can start to, I think, hopefully, get a glimpse as to what the real world might be more like. So hopefully this has given some insight both into this rather complex philosophical subject, uh, and then also maybe give us a way to think about how we tell and how we listen to or read stories. So with that, thank you all for listening, and I will see you next time.